Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of the Saturdays are for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren. I am your host. Disclaimers, not an actual professor, don't have a PhD, uh, not employed by any university, American or otherwise. Uh, just bringing out uh, ancient medieval Byzantine history. Uh, really enjoy that kind of stuff. So uh, if you found this video, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new and then hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. If you are listening on Apple Podcast or Google Play, please give us a follow. And especially if you're listening on Apple Podcast, please give a five-star review, that really helps. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, please leave comments, that also helps. Uh, I mentioned in the last video, uh, very mistakenly, that this would be back up on Spotify. Um, and that is not the case because when you download these, uh, when you download this off Zoom, it does not give you an MP3 or an audio MP4 file. It only gives you a video MP4 and an M4A, which is not compatible with Spotify. So for the time being, until I figure out a way to get this audio in an MP3 or MP4 audio format, uh, this is only going to be on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Uh, we are not going to, yeah, we'll, we'll see. It's, I, I'd like to get back on Spotify at some point because obviously it's a big, it's a big platform, but for the time being, it's just, uh, it's not in the cards. Uh, you can, uh, if you enjoy what you see, please make sure to also subscribe or follow us on Instagram. The, uh, account name is academics underscore nine, five. That's A C A D E M I X underscore nine, five for all of our latest updates other fun posts that I put out about about the history that we're talking about. Then you can also follow us on Twitter at Professor Run. So that all being said, let's jump into it. Today is going to be part uh, three. Yeah, I guess, or well, there was our intro. There were the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals. So I guess this is technically part four uh, of our uh, barbarian invasion, almost like mini series within our within our series here. And today we're going to be talking about the Huns. Ooh, it's the big one. We're going to be talking about the Huns. So the Hun, obviously we've talked a lot about the Huns in uh, many of our episodes here. Um, here, uh, here up on the screen, we have a map of the Hunnic Empire. So the Huns at uh, one point do control, they control the Hungarian steppe, they control all the way out towards the Black Sea as well as further west along along the Danube River and kind of the middle, middle to upper Danube territory. And as we talked about in the past, the Huns do uh, move west uh, onto the Hungarian plain sometime between 405 and 408, which coincides with many of the barbarian tribes that which had traditionally lived there, like the Vandals and the Swaby, also moving west, uh, with the Vandals and the Swaby reaching the Rhine, uh, the Alans as well, uh, reaching the Rhine sometime around 406. So that kind of co that coincides with that 405 to 408 time frame of the Huns moving west, and they bump all of those tribes that I just mentioned westward as well. Uh, one interesting thing about the Huns at this point in time is it seems that uh, Germanic language becomes sort of the lingua franca of the Hunnic Empire, which does make sense because if you say hypothetically the Huns show up with, uh, I'm, just, I'm just using a hypothetical number here, but let's say 50,000 Huns show up on the Hungarian plain and they're now the, the, the rulers of that area. Well, there might be 5 million Gothic people or uh, Gothic and otherwise Germanic people living on the on the steppe there. So although the Huns are the new rulers of this area, they, the, there's a lot of aspects of the culture there that they're not going to be able to change, such as the language, because you have far more uh, native people in this area versus the new uh, the new incoming people. And so that means there's going to have to be compromises between the new overlords and the existing uh, populace of this area. And so one 
uh, change that we see here is that the Huns obviously probably they probably would have maintained their Hunnic language, but in terms of an administrative language, in terms of a probably a lang language of business, you you see that uh, Germanic is going to be the the lingua franca, and then Hunnic probably the Huns probably still use that in their personal conduct with each other, uh, but even perhaps even uh, you know Attila's court has has more of a Germanic speaking component to it than a Hunnic speaking component to it. Uh, again, just, it's just sort of how it works when you have, right, you have uh, a large populace with an, you might have a new, new ruling class, but they're not as, there's not as many of them as the, as the native people who are already there. And so there's going to have to be some compromises between the old, uh, uh, the, the new overlords and the people who they're ruling over. Um, during this time as well, it does seem that the Huns would have moved from a pastoral agricultural people to a more uh, sedentary agriculture. So more sedentary agriculture, trade, commerce, industry, other econo uh, economic aspects of uh, settled people at the time. And I do kind of wonder if it, because what happens with a lot of these steppe uh, warrior tribes is that part of what makes them so uh, such fearsome warriors is their very tough, uh, very rugged, almost cowboy-like existence as pastoral agriculture uh, as their economy. And so I, I don't wonder if maybe, uh, even if it's just a little bit, it only has to be a little bit, that that might have taken a bit of the edge off the Huns in terms of their uh, uh, how, the, how they fought, how tenacious they were as warriors. Obviously, they're still very competent in terms of military, but uh, you, do, you do wonder if the, the settling down and the comforts of sedentary life have some effect on their, the, the, the military uh, aspect of these things. Another interesting thing that comes up from this is you do find, uh, I was reading about this really in, in uh, again, referring to uh, Peter Heather here, his uh, The Fall of the Roman Empire, A New History of Roman the Barbarians. Interesting bit, I, me I remember bringing up in kind of our precursor episode where I talked a lot about the Huns, uh, why there was not more DNA tests done on Hunnic uh, remains to see uh, what sort of, what, are, they, are they more Turkish? Are they, you know, uh, uh, what sort of ethnic group or, or linguistic group might they have come from? And there is, a, uh, Heather brings up something interesting here regarding uh, Hunnic burials. So I'm going to read, uh, this is from page 330, and then I'll go on to page 331 about Hunnic uh, burials and, and finding Hunnic graves. So it says, archaeological evidence confirms the point. Uh, the point, point being that it's, it, he's making is that it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what graves are Hunnic in, from, from this area, even, even going uh, far back north of the Black Sea, uh, outside of the, the, what's shown on this map here in terms of the Hunnic Empire. Since 1945, a mass of material has been unearthed from cemetery excavations on the Great Hungarian Plain and its environs dating back to the period of Hunnic dominance there. Some treasure hoards have been discovered, but no one else, sorry, but no one has ever found any of Attila's camps since only the post holes would remain. In this material, proper Huns have been proved extremely hard to find. In total, and this is, and this includes the Volga steppe north of the Black Sea, as well as the Hungarian plain, Archaeologists have identified no more than 200 burial sites as plausibly Hunnic. So not even, they're not even confirmed Hunnic grave sites. These are just possible Hunnic grave sites. These are distinguished by bows, non-standard European modes of dress, cranial deformations. Uh, some Huns bound the heads of babies, which provoked a distinctive elongated skull, and the presence of so-called Hunnic cauldrons. So either the Huns generally disposed of their dead in ways that did not leave traces or some other explanation is required for the scarcity of Hunnic material. 
So I thought that was interesting. I had brought up in the past why uh, DNA uh, tests had not been done to kind of trace back the identity or, or the origins uh, of the Huns and what kind of what kind of people they were. But this seems to be a why, right? It's very hard to pinpoint exactly what is and is not Hunnic grave. Yes, because there's so many Germanic peoples living in, in this area, it's very difficult to say this is definitely a Hunnic gravesite versus, well, maybe this is a Germanic gravesite. Okay, so our next order of business is talk to, to talk about Attila and his brother Bleda. So Attila and his brother Bleda rise to power around 434. And by this point in time, the Huns are essentially united under one rule. I guess previously uh, there had been uh, kind of split factions between the Huns, you know, some some Huns have loyalty to one uh, high-ranking uh, leader and other people have loyalty to another high-ranking leader. But by this point in time, uh, political power and influence has basically been uh, narrowed down onto, at this point in time, two people, Attila and Bleda. But uh, Attila, as we know, is going to uh, essentially have his brother Bleda taken, taken care of, as they say, uh, so that he is the cheese that stands alone. Now, no uh, set records remain of this. Uh, again, Hanuk not being a written language, uh, written records of this are fairly scarce. But it does seem that Attila went through a process of eliminating his opponents. Uh, think you can think about it if you've ever seen The Godfather. I, I thought of this when I was when I was reading about this. Uh, the baptism scene in Godfather One, where Michael Corleone uh, has the heads of the Phi family taken out, and so he eliminates all threats to his power. Uh, similarly, Attila would have been eliminating all of the threats to his power, uh, the last of which being his brother Bleda, who dies, seems to die. I remember learning this. I don't remember exactly where I learned it, but when I was a kid, I, it, it sticks out in my head that uh, Bleda seems to have died in a hunting accident. You know, Attila might have sent him off with a hunting partner, and then you know, the guy just kind of takes care of him while they're out in the woods and no one's looking, or, oh, oh, he was killed by a lion. Oh no, how terrible. Uh, and the body is so dismembered that he, you know, we, we don't even want to show it. It can barely be identified. Don't, don't let the children look, right? This, this sort of thing. But, um, so that's how, it, uh, that, that happens around 445. Uh, so by 445, Attila is the sole, uh, a power broker in the Hunnic Empire, and uh, his brother Bleda is again taken care of, as they say. Now, around 440, the Huns in the Eastern Roman Empire renegotiate uh, the treaties they have between them. Basically, the the Huns had been extorting tribute from the Eastern Romans for quite a, a while at this point. And there were, there were some, you know, at some points there were good relations between uh, the Huns and the Romans and sometimes there weren't. Sometimes the Huns were fighting, actually the Huns, uh, it was fairly common for them to fight as Roman auxiliaries, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. They would fight as auxiliary troops with the Roman, with the Roman military. But so the, uh, in, four, in 440, the Romans agree to basically double the amount of tribute they're paying to the Huns. Initially, it was 350 pounds of gold, but then they up the tribute to the Huns to 700 pounds of gold per year, which is, which is an insane, uh, that's an insane amount of money. The New Deal also allowed Hunnic merchants into Roman markets. Now, this proved to be a disaster. Again, every every time we, we see this every single time the Romans try to make some sort of concession to any of these barbarian groups, whether, the, whether it's the Goths, the Huns, the Vandals, the, the uh, Franks, the Saxon, we didn't cover, we're not covering the Franks and Saxons here, but the, the same rule holds true. Every time they try to make some sort of concession, try to extend an olive branch, it always ends up backfiring. It always ends up, they always end up with egg on their face because of this. And in this situation, the Hunnic merchants who, who come into Roman markets, uh, the Huns actually end up sending warriors disguised as merchants into the into Roman markets. And in the winter of 440 to 441, a number of forts where the markets are housed essentially are taken 
by, by the Huns. And so, so yet again, appeasement is a big failure. So winter of 440 to 441, the Huns send warriors disguised as merchants into Roman markets and, and see, essentially seize them. Now, when the Romans start complaining about this, because obviously it's a, hey, we, we allowed you to, to set up like trade uh, uh, in, in our markets here and, and you send in warriors and you end, up, you end up seizing our markets. What's this all about? Well, in response, the Huns say that there was a certain Bishop of Margus who had snuck into, the, into Hunnic territory and raided a number of graves. And this was, this was just retribution for that. Now, never mind the fact that, <laughs> that that story was incredibly, uh, it basically made up. I mean, even Heather, Heather said, you know, describes it as like, well, our, our Indiana Jones bishop here, you know, going and robbing uh, ancient sacred graves and tomb sites. It, 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 it was a pre, it was the Huns used this as a pretense to, to as, as a, to, to, to invade a Ro, uh, Roman territory again, which, which had, hap, had, had happened uh, uh, some years before, but the Huns want, want to get in again. They understand the Romans, you know, you, you punch them enough, they're going to start giving you more tribute. And, and so that's basically what the Huns were looking for. Now, also foolishly here is the, the, the Bishop of Margus himself offers his town to the Huns. Basically, he, he's come under fire from the Huns and he's saying, okay, well, maybe what I can do is if I give them my, the town that I, that I live in and that I kind of oversee, the Huns will leave me alone. Wrong. Okay. So as we see her here on the map, I, I apologize. The map is a little uh, blurry here. It's, it's the best I could, uh, the best I could find. Um, but as you can see, Margus is there kind of, kind of in the uh, upper left, left-hand side, if you're looking at this. Uh, and you can see that is where, and so what happens is when the Bishop of Margus offers his town to the Huns, they also understand that there's, the, the Huns understand there's a road that goes through Margus that leads you to a number of cities, uh, which I have written down here. Uh, it takes, it can take you to Nasus, it can take you to Sertica, Thessalonica, and even uh, Constantinople itself. So Attila and Bleda look at this as, hey, this is a great opportunity. We can get into the Roman territory. There's a road that we can use where we can easily get to a number of cities within within Eastern Roman territory. And that's exactly what they do. They enter, first they uh, sack Margus, then they sack uh, Nasus. And I think, they all, I think they also sack Sertica. Um, I'm not sure exactly. But it's at this point in time, we also see that the Huns uh, are not just a steppe, horse archer, uh, entirely cavalry type army because Nasus is a walled settlement. They, they had to conduct an actual proper siege of, of these cities and a number of other, other cities. I mean, the, the Huns rampaged through the Balkans in 447. Um, and what we see is that they're actually pretty good at sieging walled settlements. So you do, uh, the, the question, it does beg the question, well, how, how do the Huns get good in sieging if they're mostly a steppe cavalry type army? Well, one thing this indicates to us is that they have, um, their armies are a bit more balanced at this point, balanced between uh, cavalry and infantry because you need infantry, you need infantry to take, to take walled settlements. You can't take a walled settlement with just cavalry. Someone, someone needs to you know, storm the walls and bring the battering ram up to the gate and that sort of thing. Uh, but it also may indicate that when the Huns were fighting as auxiliary soldiers with the Romans, it's possible that they observed how the Romans conducted sieges and learned siege warfare from them. That's, uh, uh, Heather makes that suggestion in the book and I think it's probably, it's probably true. I mean, there, some people might, you might say, uh, well, the Huns learned it as they moved across the steppe and they sieged various cities that existed a, across the Eurasian steppe. And while it's not necessarily false that there, I, there are some cities on the Eurasian steppe and there'll be more, more cities pop up as time goes on and, and existing cities will grow. But I think it's far more likely, especially because, um, you know, any, any cities that are on the steppe are not necessarily going to be built uh, the same way. The walls are not necessarily going to be built the same way that Roman 
walls and Roman cities are built. So I think it's probably more likely that they watched how Romans see, because a lot of the sieging that would have been, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of civil wars going on, right? Fighting usurpers and one guy uh, holes up in, in a city somewhere in Gaul and you have to go siege the city and get them out and that sort of thing. So I do think it's probably, it's probably likely that the Huns would have learned, you know, observed how the Romans conducted sieges learned it that way and that's how they became free and because i mean the roman the romans are very competent in siege warfare there's no denying that and so uh, th i i think that's probably the most likely explanation as to as to how the huns get good at sieging But so by the end of this Balkan War, uh, the Huns yet again, uh, there's a renegotiation of the treaties again, and yet again, you have, um, you have uh, uh, the Romans are offering to pay the Huns even more money, which is great. Now, uh, they, uh, the, the, Rome, the Eastern Romans end up owing the Huns about uh, 6,000 pounds of gold, which is an absurd amount of money. I think I looked up earlier today, uh, that currently today the the price of gold is about seventeen hundred uh, uh, dollars an ounce. If you multiply that by six thousand pounds times sixteen ounce, or well, let's do this: uh, six thousand pounds times sixteen ounces per pound is ninety six thousand times. Seventeen forty-four dollars per ounce of gold. That equates to about one hundred sixty-seven point five, uh, one hundred sixty-seven million five hundred thousand uh, United States dollars right now. Which, I mean, if uh, for the U.S. government, that's that's a rounding error. But uh, for, for <laughs> the rest of us normal people, that's that's a heavy amount of money, and that's a that's roughly what the what the Romans end up owing the Huns. But the issue is, the Huns cannot the Romans cannot afford to pay this. The Romans seem to only pay the Huns about fourteen hundred pounds of gold, and it also seems to be the case that uh, uh, the empire was hurting so bad for money, especially because you have to understand, right? This this treaty is renegotiated around four forty seven. Uh, in 439, the Romans lost North Africa and uh, particularly Carthage to the Vandals. Okay, and even though that's that's the Western Empire, right? The Eastern Empire still does, you know, they still trade with the Western Empire. It still affects their business and it still affects the money and revenue and all of this, right? So this is at a time when, uh, and we'll we'll look at a map at this uh, late at the uh, towards the end of this towards the end of this lecture, but. Uh, this is coming at a time when revenue is not exactly booming for the Romans. So uh, offering this in the first place is, is silly, but you even, have, you even have senators at this point in time who have to dip into their own personal funds, their own, their own personal money, in order to send the Huns something to try to hold them over, because obviously the Huns are not going to be happy that you know, they're promised uh, 6,000 pounds of gold and they only get 1,400. Never mind the fact that they never should have paid them any of that to begin with. That's a complete waste of money. I mean, you, you look at, did, did that money do anything for you? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, you might as well have, have uh, thrown that money in a hole in the ice. But after, after this point in time, Attila is actually going to agree to a peace treaty with the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, this is a relief to the Eastern Romans, but it's, uh, it's pol politically and diplomatically, it's smart it's a smart move by Attila because it's going to secure his eastern front while he starts to move on to his new project, his new his, uh, this new campaign, which is going to be against the Western Empire. So while he's away in the West, he doesn't want to have to worry about anything coming up from behind him in the East. I'm actually changing the slides when I'm supposed to today. Wow. So, so uh, I think it's, it's appropriate to probably ask, why exactly was it that Attila decided to move, to move west instead of continuing his war against the Eastern Empire? I think there's a couple of factors 
at play here. One, I think he, he probably understands because Attila is a politically and, and diplomatically savvy guy. Uh, he's not, he's not some knuckle dragging uh, barbarian. He, he has, he's a highly competent guy. There's no, he doesn't, he doesn't get to the top uh, uh, and to, to rule over this, this empire and have all these people following him and, and leading large armies. If he's not, you know, if he doesn't really know what he's doing. So that's, that's, something we have to keep in mind here. So I think partly Attila recognizes that the Western Empire is weak and the Eastern Empire, although he is having his way with them in the Balkans, that is not the Eastern Empire's uh, center of, of, um, of economics, of finance. That's, that's not where the majority of the revenue is coming. Although there, there are saying Assertica is a uh, fairly wealthy city. It's certainly not Antioch. It's certainly not uh, uh, Alexandria. Certainly not even even Jerusalem at this point in time. Um, and Attila, I think I think he recognizes he doesn't have the means to go through the Balkans, go through Constantinople, or even or even go around Constantinople because in order to get to Asia, he's going to need boats, right? The Huns are not really known for for naval uh, uh, excellence, and I think he sees the the West as kind of a sitting duck. And even even had he tried to in, get invade into Asia, you know, you're so far away from home, uh, your supply lines get cut off. The Eastern Romans are far more far stronger militarily speaking, even with uh, uh, recent or well, I guess will be upcoming disasters against the Vant, right? The the imperial fleet that. Uh, is defeated by the Vandals. And so uh, that, that I think is probably mostly the reason that Attila decides to go west instead of continuing his wars against the east. There also is this story uh, which is not fully confirmed. And it's, I'll just, I'll just say right up front, I don't think this is a reason why Attila decides to go invade the Western Empire. But there does seem to be this a particular Western imperial princess who gets herself in a bit of scandal. She's either, I can't remember if she's engaged to marry somebody or she is married to somebody, but she has an affair and becomes pregnant from this affair. And her brother, the emperor, is very upset with her because the, you know, it's scandalizing the royal family and it's causing a riff in the imperial politics. And in order to try to get out from under the thumb of her brother, this particular princess, whose her name is not important, um, she writes a letter to Attila, basically saying, "I, I want to marry you. Come rescue me, and you know, come conquer Rome, and I'll be yours. And my dowry to you will be the Western Roman Empire, like half of the, the, the Western Roman Empire, or something like that." Uh, it does seem that this t the, this person. This woman did send Attila a letter, but it certainly is not, even, even if it is a true story, it's not why Attila goes, to, goes west because Attila, he conducts two campaigns against the Western Romans. The first one, as, we, as you see here on the map, in 451, which was in Gaul, and the second one, which is in 452, which was in Italy. Now, if this was really the reason why he decided to go to the Western Empire, this imperial princess is in Italy. Why does he not go to Italy first? He goes to Gaul first. Okay, so again, I don't put a lot of stock into that story. Some, histor some historians dispute uh, uh, the veracity even of that story, but it's often talked about when people bring up uh, Attila's invasions of the Western Empire, so I thought I'd bring it up and you know, just inform, inform the viewers of it. Uh, really am, I really am enjoying uh, talking about this. And if you've made it this far in the video, please, please do make sure to give it a like. Uh, and also leave a comment if you have any questions or, or you know, find anything interesting, have something you want to say. Uh, I really, I really am enjoying talking about this. This is, this is high quality stuff. Um, but so in the spring of 451, Attila uh, gathers his army, moves west across the Hungarian plain goes along the Danube, but eventually comes up along against against the Rhine and leads his army on the invasion of of Roman Gaul. Now, there's not a whole lot of sources 
that survive, at least not a lot of reliable sources that survive to, to give us any sort of detail about, uh, about what goes on during this campaign. It's safe to say that it's uh, very bloody and, and Attila wreaks a lot of havoc on Gaul, but it does come, it comes to a culmination at a particular battle, uh, uh, goes by a number of titles. I like to say the Battle of Chalon. Uh, some people will call it the Battle of the Catalonian Plains. Careful not to confuse that with the Catalan or Catal yeah, Catalan Plains. That would be in, in Spain by Barcelona. I'm saying Catalonian Plains. Um, but I like I, I learned it as the Battle of Chalon. Uh, that that just, just sticks in my head from what I, what I learned about this growing up. Uh, and at the Battle of Chalon, uh, Attila is going to go up against someone who he probably would have been somewhat familiar with, who's a Roman general named Aedius. Now, Aedius, we talked about him in our episode about the Vandals, had grown up as a hostage with, with the Huns. Uh, he, was part, he was part of a hostage exchange deal, basically, you know, we'll take one of yours, you take one of ours, so that way we're on our best behavior, and if, if you're not on uh, your best behavior, we're going to take it, we're going to kill the hostage you sent us. So Aedius is familiar with hunting culture, with hunting customs, military tactics, etc. He may even known Attila uh, on a personal level. And Aedius also not uh, not only bringing the Roman the the might of the Western Roman Empire uh, to this battle, he also brings a number of barbarian tribes, uh, Germanic tribes, along with him. Most notably, the Visigoths, with uh, their king uh, Theodoric or Theodoric, depending on how you say it. First, essentially, uh, it seems that the Huns and the Visigoths came to this understanding that well. We don't like each other, but if we don't team up to beat the Huns now, they may kill us both. So we might as well go team up and kill those guys. And then we can, after that's done, we can continue butting our head, butting heads against each other. And the Huns come along, obviously, with it. They'll have a contingent of Huns in their army. But by this point in time, the majority of their army is made up with non-Hunnic, non-ethnic Hun uh, soldiers. Lots, they're going to have lots of Germanic soldiers in their army, uh, some Iranian allens and Sarmatians as well. But the, the, the real, uh, like the, cli the, the climax of Attila's campaign here is coming at the Battle of Chalon, which is a, a, an all day long battle. It's, it's back and forth. It's very bloody by the time, you know, you know the stories say that uh, by the time the battle is over, the fields are t streaming with blood. There's entrails everywhere, the rivers are, are filled with blood, and the Romans do come out the victors, although, uh, as we say, the Romans take significant casualties during this battle, but the Huns end up being the losers, and apparently, uh, apparently, uh, I remember reading in Heather's book that Attila had to be talked off of, uh, like, uh, jumping on a funeral pyre and setting him on fire, kind of like a, the steward of Gondor in, uh, <laughs> in Lord of the Rings. I was like, I, re I, re I remember reading that, I'm like, that's a bit dramatic. But Attila takes his army back to the Hunnic Empire, back to the Hungarian steppe, licking their wounds. And people do question uh, why, why was it that I Aedius did not uh, pursue Attila? Why didn't he chase him down and finish him off? I think there's, there, there could be a couple of reasons. Uh, some people seem to suggest that maybe Aedius had a soft spot for the Huns. I, I don't necessarily know if I buy that. I mean, the, the Romans and the Visigoths did take heavy casualties during this battle. It's possible that after the battle was over, uh, Theodoric says to Aedius, you know, the Huns are leaving. Uh, we don't especially like you. I'm going to take my guys and go home. And so maybe Aedius looks at this and says, well, I could, maybe we could chase them down if we had these combined forces, but I've lost, you know, we've lost this Visigothic contingent. And there are, there are other, there are other uh, barbarian groups as well who are fighting with, with the Romans, but the most notable of them are the, are the Visigoths. The ones who come in the greatest numbers are, are the Visigoths. Uh, so it's possible, it's possible that uh, Aedius looks at it and says, uh, you know, I, I don't have the uh, manpower to go after them at this point. Uh, there, there's other things that, I mean, there's, there's like a million things going wrong in the, in the Western Roman Empire at this point in time. It's like, okay, we've handled that one problem. And maybe even if that's only not going to be a problem for a year, I, I, there's another fire I have to go put out and we need to go put that out right now. And we, if this becomes a fire later, we'll, we'll address it later. Right. 
which is in fact what ends up happening. As you can see here on the map, it's no, it's no surprise that Attila leads a second campaign against the Western Romans, this time into Italy. And the Italian campaign for the Huns was actually almost derailed almost immediately. Uh, as you can see here on the map, the city of Aquelia, uh, that was uh, one, of, one of the first steps for, for the Hunnic campaign. And if you've played, uh, uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, Attila Total War, the, the, the uh, strategy game, if you ever play as the Western Romans, you know that Aquelia is like the one city that you need to hold on to. Otherwise, it, it opens the door for, you know, any opponent you have to, to getting into Italy and, you know, messing with all of your very profitable, very wealthy provinces and cities. Uh, but the, the siege of Aquelia actually uh, almost was a disaster for the Huns. It almost completely derailed the campaign. Uh, but the Huns do end up taking Aquelia. They sack Aquelia. And they're able to move on. They take a number of city. They, they sack a number of cities in northern Italy. Uh, there's a number of them. They sack Padua, Mantua, uh, Venezia, or sorry, uh, Verona, uh, a number of other ones. You see Padavim there. They even end up, uh, they, they sack Milan as well. But, however, notably, they don't take any cities. This is, this is part of why the Huns, and we'll talk about this more towards the, as we're, we're, we're wrapping up here, you know, we're getting towards the end of this lecture, but part of the reason the Huns failed to take down the Western Romans, at least by their own direct actions, is they don't, they don't take anything from the Romans. The Romans don't lose any streams of revenue from the Huns. I mean, the Huns certainly take a lot of stuff from them. They take a lot of money from them, but they don't lose. Remember, remember in the ancient world and in the medieval world, really up until the modern, really up until the early modern, modern era, wealth is entirely dependent on land. Land produces wealth, land produces revenue. And so if you are a state like the Roman empire and you have an opponent like the Huns, uh, who is dealing you military blows and sacking your cities, it's really it's, it's bad, but it could be significantly worse if you were losing land to the Huns because, again, land equals revenue. Now, this is, this is why uh, the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the, the Franks are much more damaging to the Huns, uh, the, um, the, 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 the Saxons as well, because all of them are taking, they, they all siphon land away from the Romans, which siphons away revenue. Now, very notably, during Attila's Italian campaign, you get Attila, Attila uh, after he's uh, sacked like you know, Padua and Aquelia and Milan and all of, these, all of these wealthy cities in Northern Italy, he starts to march on the city of Rome itself. And yet again, we saw that we talked about uh, this guy in a previous episode, Pope Leo, uh, who's, now, who's now a saint, comes out of Rome to talk to Attila to try to dissuade him from, from taking Rome because the uh, Pope understands that you know, the Visigoths had sacked Rome, but uh, the Visigoths were at least Arian Christians. So as we, as we talked about, you can go back and listen to our episode on St. Augustine talking about how uh, people, both Christians and Roman pagans, found safety in, in Catholic churches in Rome uh, when the Visigoths sacked, right? The, the Visigoths, when they sacked, Roman 410 would not go into a church and, and do people harm. If they found it outside of the church, different story. But if you're hiding in a church, even, even the pagans found refuge uh, in Catholic churches during the 410 sack. But Attila, the Huns are not Christian. It's a different story. Uh, and the Pope understands that if the Huns get into Rome, this is gonna be really, really bad. This is gonna be far worse than what happened with the, with the Visigoths in 410. It's gonna be far worse than what would happen the, uh, uh, couple of years from now, this would be uh, three years into the future with the uh, Vandal sack of Roman 455. So Attila and Pope Leo go out and they have a meeting. And this is one of the great mysteries of history because there's no, there's no record of what's said at this meeting. No one, no one takes minutes. There's no, there's no uh, even, there's no transcript of the meeting. There's no secondhand or thirdhand accounts 
of, of what was said. It's, it's, you would, the only way you be able to know what happened there would be if you, if you built a time machine and went back and kind of, kind of stood outside the tent and kind of listened in, right? Uh, but after the meeting, Attila does turn around and take his, he takes his army and heads back home to, uh, to uh, where the Hunnic Empire was. Now, Heather in his book uh, tries to downplay uh, the importance of this meeting. He basically says that Attila's line of supplies are cut. He's, you know, he doesn't, there's not enough food in, in Northern Italy for his army to live off the land. Uh, Aetius had organized along with the Eastern Romans uh, raids into the Hunnic Empire. So Attila has to go back home and, and manage that. My, my contention is while that may be true and you know, Northern Italy is a very fertile place. It does produce a good amount of food. I have to imagine that even, even a large army like, like Attila's would have been able to manage uh, uh, living off the, the food of the land there. Uh, uh, and while it may be true that they did, the supply lines were not properly set up, you know, they're not organized the same way a Roman army is organized in terms of supply lines and, and keeping lines of communication open and this kind of thing. Um, that's not to say that, that Pope Leo might not have talked to Attila about those kinds of things during the meeting. You know, it's entirely possible that he, he comes into the meeting and says, you know, hey, look, Attila, I've been hearing your soldiers kind of hungry. Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of supply. You're just you're living off whatever you're raiding. You know, maybe it'd be a better idea if you just went home. Your guys are going to become discontent. What happens if you have uh, uh, mutinies on your hand? I kind of, you, you, there's, there's no guarantee that, that uh, Leo did not say that, that, you know, I think most people, when they hear about this, they think that, it, you know, he goes in and says, well, God will punish you if, if you sack the city and using a whole lot of religious, you know, language. I think this is, in, in, uh, I'm, I'm sure Leo said that, uh, said things like that. However, I, I think people don't, uh, a lot of modern people don't necessarily understand how Christians think uh, and how we operate, you know, not everything is just a, a God, God's punishment sort of thing. You know, it, Leo is a, Pope Leo is a highly, highly competent guy. It's not, he may not have only made uh, religious arguments to Attila during the meeting. Uh, but, but whatever the reason may be, Attila does turn around uh, uh, and returns back to the Hunnic Empire on the Hungarian plain uh, uh, during four 452 essentially he does not sack rome uh and again as we say the huns do not take any territory permanently from the romans now while the rating is a, the rating is an issue uh in heather's book he talks about how um in the areas around rome after the 410 sack uh even a, i think it's like a decade later these, these areas in and around Rome are only producing one seventh of the tax revenue that they had produced before the, before the sack. And that, that's significant. That's really significant that a decade later, that area had not come even close to recovering from the damage is pretty, is pretty impressive. Uh, and then you consider the damages that would have been done by the Huns in this campaign and the damages that will be done later by the Visigoths in their sack. I mean, you're talking about a ser uh, uh, damages that would be difficult for, for us from a, from a modern perspective to understand. But as we can see here, let me see if I can move myself. Hopefully I've not moved myself so that you can see the map better. But the real, the, the, so I want to have a brief discussion about why the Huns failed to take down the Western Roman Empire by their direct action, again, indirectly, by, by, by disrupting all of these different uh, Germanic barbarian and a couple of non-Germanic barbarian groups, right? That's really the, the indirect action of the Huns is what leads to the fall of the Western Roman Empire, not the direct action of the Huns. And so as we can see on this map, as I, as I, as I keep emphasizing, Land equals revenue. Major almost the entire reason for the Roman state, uh, the, the reason for its existence is to collect taxes to 
pay the military. You know, people talk today about like the, the, the military industrial complex. You know, I mean, granted the, the United States, I think spends 13 to 15% of its, of its budget on the military. For the Romans, it was something like 90 to 95% of their budget went to the military. The literally the state existed to pay the military, right? And when, right, so this is a map of all of the land the Romans are losing to these various, to these various barbarian groups. You see the Visigoths have their bit there, the Swabies have their bit there, the Vandals have their bit in North Africa, the Moors are in North Africa, Britain is completely lost, the Burgundians are establishing their kingdom, uh, the Franks are starting to, um, the Franks are starting to impo uh, uh, threaten uh, Northern Gaul as well. All of the, this is what's really, uh, really harming the Romans. This losing of land, the loss of revenue, meaning very difficult to upkeep the military, very difficult to pay yourself. A lot, a lot of this, the, the issues for Roman soldiers at this point, they, they're not getting paid, you know, and, and so that means Ro there, there's plenty of Romans, ethnic Romans around to join the military, but they're looking at it and they're like, well, if I'm not getting a paycheck, I'm not going out there and possibly dying for this empire. And it's interesting. I was reading, I'm reading uh, uh, ahead a little bit for, for the Byzantine uh, side of thing. We're, we're going to, as soon as the fall of Rome is over, we're going to definitely take a more oriental focus. Uh, but the emperors uh, Leo and Zeno actually uh, uh, do a lot to, to raise the, the revenue of the Eastern Roman empire. And they, they actually manage to recruit lots of new Roman soldiers, not, uh, German Federati soldiers, they're recruiting ethnic Roman soldiers because wouldn't you know, the more funds they have, the more they, 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 they do a lot to cut the, to trim the fat and cut out corruption and raise revenue. All of a sudden you start offering better pay for soldiers, more guys are going to start showing up and, and they're your guy. They're not, you know, uh, uh, barbarians from a different tribe who made it, who the only loyalty they have is to their paycheck. In many instances, no, those are real, those are Roman soldiers. Those are guys who are loyal to the empire. And, and so this, this idea that, well, uh, there just weren't enough Romans around to, uh, to, to join the army. And well, the, the reason for that, I, th I think there's enough men or men in, uh, uh, remaining in the empire who could join and be, be productive contributing soldiers. But if they're not going to get a paycheck, sorry, they're not joining. And this, this we see here on the map is why. I mean, losing, losing almost the entirety of Spain, uh, losing significant portions of Gaul, and then completely losing North Africa, which, as we said, the wealthy, it was the wealthiest uh, province of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, Carthage, arguably one of the wealthiest cities of the Western Roman Empire. It's a massive uh, hit to revenue. And, and that's ultimately why the, the Huns, Again, by, by their indirect actions, by, by bumping, by disrupting all these, all these tribes, that's what's, that's what's really going to cause the, the fall of the Western Roman Empire, not the Huns' direct invasion of the Western Roman Empire itself. So that's all we have for this lecture this week. I really hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking about it. Thank you guys so much for listening, watching, however, however you're consuming it. I do enjoy, I enjoy talking about this a lot. I really do. Uh, I, I'm having a lot of fun coming on here and, and giving these lectures and uh, interacting with the people who, who are commenting on the videos, even though there may not be a lot right now. Still, I, pre I really do appreciate uh, uh, those of you who are here and who are following and who are supporting. Please do, you know, share this with your, with your friends, share this, you know, if you're a university student, share it with your classmates, your professors whoever, I'll, I'll, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll kind of take anything. I want to give a thank you to uh, Eastern Roman History, uh, who's, who's uh, generously given us uh, some shout outs. I really do appreciate that. So go check out his channel. He does some really good uh, Eastern Roman, uh, no, Eastern Roman History is the name of the channel, but he, he does a, a lot more, um, so, some more micro things than what I'm doing. Mine is much more macro, more of a 50,000 foot view. He does some more things where he takes a much closer look on 
like like he did a, like a day in the life like what it, what would a day in the life of uh, eastern roman citizens be like I, that was a very interesting video i thought um so go check him out uh make sure you like the video if you're watching on youtube also subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode if you're listening on apple podcast please give us uh, a follow and a five-star review and if you're listening on google play please give us a follow there as well follow us on instagram the account is academics underscore nine five that's a-c-a-d-e-m-i-x underscore nine five for updates about the show and other fun things I, i'll post about various things uh, in ancient, medieval, and Byzantine history. And then you can also follow us on Twitter at Professor Ren. So that's it for this week's lecture, and I'll see y'all next time.